Lord Lawson, tomorrow, it is 40 years since the last time there was a campaign, the kind of which we expect to see. What are your memories of that time? It was, in a sense, a non-event. Uh, the uh, uh, Heath government had just uh, negotiated British entry, and then Heath had lost the election. Labour had come in with Harold Wilson, and they were a bitterly divided party. Uh, there were some, he was then dead, but Harold Wilson's predecessor, Hugh Gateschool, was passionately opposed to Britain joining the European Economic Community, as it was known in those days. Uh, but there are others in his party, like Roy Jenkins, who were equally committed to joining whatever European venture could be uh, cobbled together. And so the, the Harold Wilson thought that the only way he could really uh, keep his party together was to say, well, the Tories got in on terrible terms. I am going to renegotiate the terms and then put them to the people in a referendum. Very much, very similar, in fact. I mean, uh, David Cameron is really walking in uh, Harold Wilson's footsteps. So David Cameron is holding this referendum and he's just to keep the party together? Well, not just to pe keep the party together, but that is a large part of it. A large part of it. And uh, so Harold Wilson then went and did his renegotiation. And the concessions he got through the renegotiation were so trivial that nobody can day, today can even remember what they were. <laughs> but anyhow, he said, I've had this great triumph, and he put it to the people in the referendum, and the people voted by two to one to, to stay in. If at that point the opponents were considered to be slightly nutty, how do you think the opponents to staying in are considered now? And who should lead the campaign in your view? That's a very good question because there isn't anybody. Nobody? No, I can't see anybody as the leader of the no campaign or the leader of the out campaign, what you like to call it. And that is, uh, that is quite an important factor. If you say you can't see anybody, how does the campaign have a hope then? Well, uh, I think that the odds are that we will see a repetition of what happened in 1975. I think that it is likely that the changes that David Cameron secures will be inconsequential, of no significance at all. He will present them as a major change. And I don't think there will be a two to one majority in favor. I don't think it'll be as big as that. But the likelihood is, given the authority that he has, and given the lack of a credible uh, opposition leader, uh, I think that uh, it will probably be the same result and then the British people will come to regret it. The British people will come to regret staying in? Or yes. they will yes, come I to regret? Yes, I think they'll come to regret staying because they will discover that there hasn't been any fundamental change and that there is a real problem. A real problem because it has changed since 1975 in a fundamental way. Uh, it has changed because of the coming of the single currency, the euro, and the creation of the eurozone. You say what David Cameron is looking for in his renegotiation is trivial. He's not expecting. No, he's to get looking anything. for he's looking for more than that. But what he will secure will be trivial. I know the European Union very well. I mean, as a minister, I went to all these European conferences and I made friends with all these European ministers. I know them very well and I like them. They're not going to give him anything significant. So is this renegotiation, all this shuttle diplomacy, we see him sort of chasing around European capital to European capital. In reality, it's cosmetic. Well, he, d he wants it not to be cosmetic. Uh, he wants it to, to achieve something significant. But you're saying very clearly there's a risk he'll do what, in your words, Wilson did. Absolutely. Wave something around, say it's a great triumph. And actually, uh, to quote you, it's a load of rubbish. Well, uh, I don't think I use those words, but nevertheless, that is, that is right. I think anything he can secure will be inconsequential. If that is the political reality, isn't there a very great risk then being taken by David Cameron that he will carry out this renegotiation, not really come back with anything to show for it, present it as a great triumph, but people will come to feel as if they were misled? Well, they may do, but in the short run, 
uh, I can see why he's doing this. In the short run, uh, he will be able to say, this is, you know, we've had a referendum, the people have spoken, and that's put the issue to bed. And for a time, uh, that may work. So I can see the benefit to him in doing that. But isn't the reality, there are many people in the Conservative Party for whom what he's delivered will not be enough, will never be enough, and actually the very fact of having gone through the renegotiation might make the Eurosceptic cause even stronger, might increase those voices and increase the tensions in the Tory party. Well, it might, but not in the short term. I think in the short term, uh, I mean, in the next few years, uh, he has bought peace within the Tory party. It won't last forever, but I think for this parliament, it probably will. But you're very clear it doesn't settle the question for the No, it doesn't settle the question. I think ultimately we have to choose to bring either wholly in or wholly out. What should David Cameron say to his ministers? Should people in the cabinet be allowed to campaign for out if that's what they believe? I don't think he will allow that, but I think he should. And if he does not, should people resign? That's for them to decide. Lord Lawson, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.